Welcome to Decred in Depth, your source for all things Decred. I'm your host, Angelo, and on today's show, I'm interviewing Adaptive Capital President Murad Mahmudov. Murad is currently managing Adaptive Capital with partners Willie Wu and David Pohl. I hope you enjoy this conversation as we dig into crypto economics and Murad's investment thesis for Decred. And he's no introduction. All you need to do is search iTunes or however you consume your podcast and you'll get his intro, you'll get his history, you'll get his background. With Decred in Depth, this is a Decred-centered podcast where we're going to cover all things Decred. And this is a very special episode. I'm going to let Murad cover the basics of crypto economics, his views on Decred, his views on Bitcoin. So for the first question, I'm going to start with the, the basics and the essence. You know, what is sound money? Sound money is money which essentially gets tampered with as little as possible. For centuries, economists, writers, anthropologists typically refer to gold when they talked about sound money. Um, In in this case, the word sound is used um, to differentiate from fiat or government-mandated currencies, which are generally considered unsound by uh, a number of Austrian economists and various other economists from other unorthodox schools. But generally, the idea here is that the managers and the policymakers around fiat currency can expand or contract the supply based sort of on their own views, on their own opinions, Uh, essentially the value of the currency that you're holding is dependent on um, these people's decisions. Another definition or another way to look at sound money is essentially a form of money that's decided by the market, not ordained above by the state. The problem with even today's quote-unquote capitalistic societies is that while we have competition between burger chains and shampoos and restaurants and everything else, um, money, which is a, one of the most desired things in the world, one of the most important products in the world, um, one of the most tools in the world, essentially uh, most governments have a local monopoly on money, which they enforce with a series of laws, penalties, banking regulations, and a, a whole host of other things, including borders, sort of capital controls, FX rules, etc. Gold, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, gold was something that wasn't sort of ordained by any particular king or by any particular government or by any particular bank or parliament. Uh, people were using gold. Um, in many cases, even before the creation of uh, modern day states as we know them. Essentially, gold was chosen by the market, not by, any, not by some kind of president. And um, the way people ended up using gold is it wasn't immediate. Uh, many groups of people throughout time and space um, have independently come to either silver or gold as sort of their final uh, form of money. Some people used precious stones, other people used wampums, some people used even things like salt and, and, and tobacco. Typically, it were, it were things that were relatively fungible and most importantly scarce. The reason why certain forms of money replaced others throughout history is that people gradually um, and uh, sort of with time, they found things that are scarcer than even the money that they used at that particular time. So, uh, for example, copper was scarcer than salt, for example. And then eventually people realized that silver is scarcer than uh, copper. When we talk about scarcity in particular, we're referring to the amount of that good that is generally produced in that particular area. And in, in, today's, in today's time, like the world at large, per year, 
relative to the amount that's already existing above ground. Some economists refer to this as the stock to flow ratio. And so um, gold's stock to flow ratio is higher than silver's, which means that only a small amount gets produced every year. Additionally, on top of existing supplies, I believe the typical, the number is like 1.6 or 1.7%. And um, the reason, one of the three or four reasons why cryptocurrencies are very interesting is because in the next several years with Bitcoin, for example, uh, its stock to flow ratio is going to be even higher than that of gold. As we know, the inflation rate of Bitcoin is uh, being programmatically reduced every four years. And so Bitcoin, um, I believe, and, and several others people believe, several other people believe that it has potential to be even sounder, even harder, even scarcer than gold. And so I think that's like one of the biggest forces driving this industry as a whole. So now if inflationary assets promote spending and deflationary assets promote saving, it's logical to choose the latter. Uh, what deficiencies are we not seeing in deflationary assets? like Bitcoin? So it all depends on the speed of inflation and the speed of deflation. A lot of people, um, especially sort of on the Keynesian, post-Keynesian, um, modern monetary theorists and other, other sort of um, economists this, these days, they think that inflation is preferable to deflation. Um, oftentimes, in terms of sort of their politics, these are people that are le relatively left-leaning and they believe in big government and they believe that um, the government should manage sort of the day-to-day -day affairs of many, many industries and people, including monetary policy. And that, that and essentially that it's completely okay for the government to print more money, essentially creating new wealth from thin air at the expense of the populace or at the expense of people that are holding fiat currency whenever they want. Typically, people in cryptocurrencies hold the opposite view. They believe that no sort of living human being should have the power to create wealth from thin air. We believe it's unjust and unfair. And essentially, the whole point here is to replace humans with um, mathematics and cryptography because um, we believe that technology and software code is less susceptible to corruption and can potentially offer stronger guarantees of various kinds than people that uh, particularly in times of um, economic weaknesses or war or, or just due to greed or fear, um, they are more susceptible to both mistakes and corruption. And uh, historically, we're seeing that an average fiat currency only lasts 26 years. And more importantly, um, it's Almost always that eventually, even if, if, even if it might take two or three centuries, fiat currencies end up inflating or, or hyperinflating and either being replaced by another currency or, or, or a new currency gets invented, etc. But typically, there, there, are def, there are certain trade-offs between inflationary and deflationary um, assets and regimes. Um, deflationary assets definitely... Uh, incentivize sort of investing for the long term, saving money, uh, generally investing in ventures and projects which are um, can can even be decades long. Um, some people even speculate that the reason in during the Renaissance and during the Enlightenment we had so much quality art and uh, architecture and sculpture uh, because gold was the predominant money of the time. Uh, in Italy, in France, in, in, in Europe at the time. And um, due to its uh, less inflationary nature than modern day fiat currencies, uh, people believe that the nature of, like because money plays such a big role in society and, and psychology and, and all our sort of cognitive habits, um, because it was scarcer and less inflating that, than traditional fiat currencies, um, it even affected the average or median psyche of the masses. And essentially people were saving more rather than today when a lot of the times people simply sort of, whenever they have any money, they spend it very, very quickly. Uh, because essentially central banks and governments are shaping people to... Um, they're, they're, you can think of, of the populace at large as kind of like a laboratory you're at. And, and, where, and the money is essentially an, a way to electrocute people, to design their behavior. And we believe that essentially monetary policy shouldn't be a thing at all. And it should be set in stone and should be like rock hard and iron completely solid. But um, the, the trade-off, like there's, there's obviously like pros and cons to every situation. 
um, mild inflation of like one to three percent is not super dangerous. Similarly, I believe that um, mild deflation of one to two percent isn't dangerous either, because just as profits go down, the um, the costs sorry, sorry just as um, even though the um, like employee salaries will probably go down gradually in nominal terms and same with sort of input costs and, and revenues and profits. What really matters is um, purchasing power rather than, rather than numbers on paper. And in that regard, I believe that in the free markets, everything will adjust and everything will be the same. Now, um, the general theory is that sort of some people say that inflationary currencies are good because they incentivize people to like build startups or invest in a lot of things um, for good and bad reasons, sort of employ these spray and pray uh, sort of investment strategies. But um, I think that it also leads to a lot of malinvestment and a lot of sort of things that essentially just like are burning money, things like Theranos and essentially people not doing enough due diligence. I believe that um, sounder money or slightly more deflationary money will change the fabric of culture itself. And uh, people will think twice. People will think longer before spending or investing their money. In general, I think the amount of due diligence and preparation and research, when and it's this is not just about finance and investments. This is about everything, all facets of life. I think people will do will, will be essentially more detail oriented and also more long termist. And I think in in, in today's world of um, two hundred forty five trillion dollars of debt around the world, which will probably not get paid. Um, sort of more disciplined characters on average across the world would definitely serve the world in a good way. So now, circling back to the metals, we know that gold stood the test of time as a premium store of value because it differentiated itself enough in comparison to the other metals. Copper eroded, silver was not scarce enough. With Bitcoin being first to market, its proof of work system, the liquidity and the Satoshi narrative be enough? Or do you feel that other crypto assets who separate themselves enough from Bitcoin will have a chance to coexist? So one of the biggest sort of um, debates or kind of um, discussions right now in the cryptocurrency slash crypto asset investment space is whether this market will end up being winner take all or winner take most. In this case, winner take all would probably be a situation where Bitcoin takes 95% or more of the market for crypto monies or crypto stores of value or just the digital money in the future in general. And uh, the second sort of view is that what we're likely to see, particularly in the medium term, is that um, we will see a convergence towards three to five chains that are both the most used and are simultaneously their native crypto assets are the most likely store of value candidates. Um I think it may or may not be winner take all, but I think that's like many, many decades away because this is still a very sort of fresh, new, immature, inefficient asset class. I can't uh, speculate with certainty about what's going to happen 50, 60 years from now. My current view is that for the next two or three decades, we're much more likely to see the latter. Essentially, uh, a Pareto style distribution where there's essentially three or four relevant blockchains and the other 1,000, 2,000 tokens that exist right now are essentially going to die a slow death. But the three or four uh, other blockchains are going to be uh, used quite extensively in, in various ways. And there will probably be distributed Pareto style. So like 70, 20, 8, 2, like very roughly speaking. And sort of that's where my thesis is at the moment. If we, for the moment, assume that the latter is going to be the medium term reality, then I think that uh, Decred has a very strong potential to be a top three, top four coin. I'm not saying at the moment that it's going to surpass Bitcoin because Bitcoin has very strong network effects, but I think Decred could easily become number two or number three. Uh, I think it's far superior to a number of other coins right now that are in the top 10. And Decred being at what, like 31, 30, number 31, number 32 right now, I think from a f purely fundamental perspective, it's massively undervalued by the market. And I think that like one of my theses right now is that the median IQ, quote unquote, so to speak, in the space will keep increasing cycle to cycle. We're already kind of seeing that with um, Bitcoin and a couple of other premium altcoins essentially outperforming everything else in the last 45 days. Yeah. I think that's like early evidence of, of this thesis being true. And um, essentially, I think... Um, like Decred is 
we can get into more detail here, of course, but Decred is differentiated in very, very interesting ways for it to become like somewhere in, in the top five. So now let's cover your views on monetary collectibles slash commodities, accounting systems, digital governments, and social contracts. Yeah, so, you know, blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, they lend themselves to a lot of sort of interesting, um, interesting thought pieces, interesting metaphors, interesting parallels. Some people look at these things as technological platforms or sort of software development platforms. They bring to this space a lot of the frameworks that have been used in the Web.2 world and the software as a service world and in, in a number of other sort of Silicon Valley paradigms. Um, for the longest time, I thought, and I still do, um, consider these things more like um, just monetary collectibles. Some people describe them as um, essentially like scarce digital commodities. Um, some people, you can even consider it like a, a, a digital jewelry. It, these things aren't sort of stores of value today, but they certainly have potential to be. And e- further down the line to become a medium of exchange as well. But right now, they're still essentially, they call them proto-monies. They're pre-monies, right? They're stores of value candidates. And today, we're still in, definitely in the collectible stage. It's, it's a very speculative stage, but I believe that as liquidity and size grows, um, calling these things stores of value will become more and more acceptable. Uh, let me ask you, what are some of the valuation systems you use for crypto assets? Frankly, I don't believe that you can value uh, cryptocurrencies of the store of value or uh, of the money variety precisely. Money is something that is essentially priced, not valued. Um, in general, in the future, like the purpose of money is to reduce anxiety by uh, transfer by being by being a vessel or a vehicle which you can use to transfer your uh, wealth, your fruits of labor from the past to the future and also across space, so across space and time. Essentially, because of this, the price, the quote unquote price for money or the purchasing power of money, its, its price is determined by the market. It, it, it is, it's, going, it's going to always be volatile to some extent. But um, I think that like it's definitely not something where you can like construct a discounted cash flow or give a specific formula because um, essentially in the long term, some economists believe that if people believe that there's going to be an economic boom in the next two or three years and money money's priced by the market and unmanaged, then, then essentially money will get cheaper as people will desire sort of riskier assets and make investments. And if people believe that the next two or three years, the economy is likely to see a much like sort of riskier and depressive times, then um, they're much more likely to demand money as it's the most liquid and sort of secure, uh, most agreed upon recognizable commodity. So really, um, as I've said, money cannot be valued, it can be priced. Now, there are other crypto assets that aren't trying to be store of value or money candidates. Um, these are examples of things like Augur, Numeraire, um, things like Keep, things like LifePeer. And essentially the idea here is that you can stake the asset or you can perform some kind of work. And either one or the other gives you a privilege to receive some portion of the cash flow or the fees that are passing through the system. These are kind of similar to like a quasi equity. And it's essentially a decentralized way to share um, the fees and the revenues and, and the cash flows that are flowing through the system among a certain group of stakeholders. But um, there are relatively straightforward discount, discounted cash flow-like ways to sort of value these things. But you have to differentiate between these sort of uh, work token or quasi-equity models and sort of store value candidates, which are more sort of silver and gold-like. So tell me about your research and what attracted you to look at Decred. So during this bear market in particular, I was um, I knew that the bear market is still going to be lasting for a couple more months. This was like mid 2018, early 2018, and uh, I've realized so I've realized that this time would probably be best spent just studying the top 100 projects, top 100 coins in depth to see whether there are any other good investment opportunities outside of Bitcoin, and. The more I learn things, the like the the more Bitcoin maximalistic I would I, I would become because essentially I, like 
there's very, very few pockets of value outside of Bitcoin in this whole space, in my opinion. Um, for the longest time, I thought about like, if it would be winner take most rather than winner take all, what would the relevant differentiation be? Which is like an important question from an investment standpoint. I think a lot of investors in 2017, 2018, some even today, they di- quote unquote diversify their crypto asset portfolio by investing in privacy coins, coins with programmability, coins with higher throughput. But in general, sort of these three things, um, on-chain programmability, on-chain throughput, on-chain privacy, to me, they are essentially more like features rather than fundamental base, core, important sort of valuable foundations. And when I made a list of all the things that I think are the most important, particularly in the market for store of value, I have personally concluded, at least in my opinion, that um, security and sort of everything that comes with it and governance are probably the two most important things. And the reason I like Decred is that it is differentiating quite significantly on both of these fronts, on on both of these major fronts, as well as a couple of minor minor ones also. And um, people like Adam Back and a couple of other prominent members of the Bitcoin community, they often say things like, if there's, any, if there's some kind of a technological breakthrough in, in an altcoin or in another project and it's proven and it's safe, we can just add it into Bitcoin. Now, even if we ignore the complexities of doing something like that on the fly with Bitcoin's hyper-conservative governance model, I think um, I really like Decred because it not only differentiates itself technically, and we can talk about sort of the structure of its ledger a little bit more as well, but even more so, in my opinion, it's differentiating itself sort of in socio-political ways. Um, coming back to the topic, um, you can view these things not just as money, but also as accounting systems, but also as something like a digital government or a digital collective or a social contract. And the Decred social contract is, uh, ha- is, is quite starkly different from Bitcoin's. Um, investors have far more say. I mean, y- you could argue that the two strongest groups of stakeholders in Bitcoin are the devs and the miners. In Decred, it's more like a triangle between the devs, miners, and also the investors, the proof of stake uh, stakeholders, right? And um, all in, in main, there's many interesting synergistic things in Decred, other than sort of the very extensive differentiation across the governance and um, security capacities. I think the treasury is a very, very wise decision to have been implemented for the long term. I, ha- I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, if I'm right about my Decred thesis, I think there's going to be a tremendously large sum of money um, under the guidance of the Decred community. And in the future, this could prove to be very, it could prove to be a very, very powerful sort of piggy bank for, for the project. Last but not least, I think the higher resistance to forks is something that's very, very attractive about Decred. As the space converges to three, three, four, five of blockchains that are of importance, I think forks are going to be increasingly less acceptable, particularly on the investor side of things. I think they ruin network effects, and I think they're not the most elegant way of um, sorting out governance issues. In general, people kind of um, underlook this, but I think the combination of on-chain governance, the treasury, which is scarce, and fork resistance, as well as the checks and balances between the proof of stake and the proof of work components. All these things, in my opinion, work in synergy to promote cooperation rather than friction and forking um, when you compare Decred to other chains. And you kind of see that in the Decred community. It's, um, It's very passionate, it's very zealous, so to speak. And I think a lot of people find it attractive that compared to Bitcoin or Ethereum, you actually have a voice in, in, in Decred. As somebody who's staking, you're doing three things at the same time. You are voting how to spend the money. You are voting on major sort of software changes to the consensus algorithms. And you are also um, voting on every single block, which uh, is, is very, very powerful as well. So now what makes Decred a better silver to Bitcoin's gold than say Litecoin? Yeah, so um, my, my vision and my thesis for Decred isn't so much, as I've said, as a Bitcoin destroyer, but it is something that can destroy Litecoin, XRP, Bitcoin Cash, and frankly, all the other trash that exists in the car- in current top 10 uh, on CoinMarketCap. I think Decred is massively fundamentally undervalued. 
Litecoin essentially does nothing that Bitcoin cannot do. Uh, investing in Litecoin is just pointless. Decred, however, does, as I've mentioned, five to six things differently in very, very different ways. And I think, um, as cliche as it sounds, Decred has potential, is, is much more likely and a much better digital silver than Litecoin is. And frankly, I think, I believe in the next five to six years, more and more investors will be, will be realizing some of these things that we're talking about today. And uh, I think wealth will be flowing from altcoins and as well as from outside of the space. And I think a certain uh, minority percentage of the portfolio will be allocated to Decred. And I think Decred's market cap will consistently grow. So how can Bitcoin and Decred coexist in the same world? So as I've said, like this market may- Because I'm with you on not being a Bitcoin destroyer. Right. I think, um, I don't know if this, if this market is going to be strictly winner take all, even if that's the case, although I'm not sure, that will take at least 60, 70 years in my opinion. Now, there's two things I'll say here. I think the market for money is around $100 trillion. And I'm not sure that people or the world will be comfortable for only one asset to take all of that $100 trillion. I think there is space for two, three, or four. I would also say that these things aren't metals. Gold was essentially close to winner take all. These things are hybrid money software. And in general, software has strengths and weaknesses. The strength is that we could create something that's even more disinflationary than gold. But the weakness is that bugs exist and that uh, software is generally more fragile than atomic metals are, right? And um, I think for the time being, people will... A lot of people may be holding uh, a couple of other cryptocurrencies and crypto assets other than Bitcoin and be partially hedging, be it pure proof of work fears, mining related fears, uh, hedging sort of the Bitcoin's sort of hash algo, hedging the programming language used, hedging the governance model in particular, potentially hedging the lack of money. I think Decred will be a very wealthy blockchain going forward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, if you sort of list all the differences, big and small, Decred essentially is different in like nine to 10 different ways. And I think it's sufficiently and extensively differentiated in all these regards for it to be a credible sort of competitor, or if not a competitor, something to simply also have in your portfolio. So... Coming back to what you said before, explain to me why you believe smart money will only allocate to the top three or four store value candidates. They're, the network effects of liquidity and brand are very powerful, but both when it comes to technology and when it comes to money, let alone when you have two in one. Um, I think the thing about liquidity is that um, when you are storing your wealth somewhere and this asset isn't a cash flow producing asset or it's not real estate or it's not a collectible, um, then if, if it's a monetary commodity, then you want it to be as liquid as possible because the more liquid something is, then the more likely that you can go to sleep and wake up without there any without any major shakeups sort of having have happened, right? As I've said, the purpose of money is to, one of the purposes, one of the major purposes of money, in my opinion, and the one which is most powerful when it comes to market pricing is um, its function to transfer wealth across time. And I think eventually there's only so many currencies that can exist in the free market. I mean, we're definitely not going to have more than, like having 10 currencies isn't something that will happen. But at the same time, as we've discussed, I don't think it's going to be one like right off the bat. I think Decred having a strong foundation in governance makes it kind of a blank state. We as a community can evolve it. We can tweak it. We can sort of adapt both to challenges and needs of of the world and of this technology. And um, I'm excited to see um, and I'm quite confident that sort of this functional governance I think it's going to be very useful going forward. So when we talk about a store of value in crypto assets, what makes Decred so attractive as a store of value? Um, It all starts from security. And um, as a couple of essays in the recent months have shown, um, I recommend some of the writing by Zubair Zia on Medium and also on Brian Stafford um, on GitHub. Hybrid proof of work slash proof of stake is extremely secure on a per um, unit of market cap basis. 
just for the sake of the of the thought experiment, assuming that if Decred and Bitcoin were of equal market caps, then um, I believe that the math has shown that Decred would be 22 and a half times more expensive to attack. Now, of course, Decred is a much smaller blockchain in terms of market cap today, but that means that for Bitcoin to roughly be uh, as expensive to attack as Bitcoin from a 51% attack perspective, then uh, Decred would only need to be like 5 to 6% in size. And I think security is the most important thing when it comes to money. Uh, we've, we've, touched, we've briefly touched on the topic of anxiety reduction. Anxiety reduction means protection from theft, from re- reorgs, from the chain being, um, like being tampered with in any way, um, both on an intra-block basis as well as on a more extrogenous basis. And um, that's so, sort of, we, we've, we've discussed the 51% attack, which is kind of an attack from the outside. Because uh, stakers need to approve every single block, I believe that um, certain um, sort of smaller and internal attacks such as fee sniping, selfish mining, uh, block space censorship, empty blocks, they're also more difficult to pull off in Decred by miners alone. Uh, once again, because every single block needs to be approved by the investors that are staking. And... Um, as my good friend Permanble Nino likes to underline uh, very often, um, not in all, but in many ways, um, Decred offers, in many ways, it offers even stronger accounting and ledger guarantees than Bitcoin does. Because of its hybrid system. Because of its hybrid system, um, Decred, I believe, has never had a reorg bigger than one block, which is remarkable for a chain that's been live for three years. The chain has never had any major bugs that have halted the chain. Um, and I have heard even from Bitcoin contributors and very prominent people in the space overall that um, the quality of Decred engineers is very, very high. Now, um, sort of the next point I want to touch on is that little known fact is that LND, the Lightning Network daemon, is actually a fork of BTCD, which itself was the base upon which Decred was built and was built uh, essentially was built by the current Decred team. I think that is, uh, it's, it, I think it's crazy that people don't know this and it's something that we should definitely bring to attention. And there's a twofold reason why I say this. First of all, the scarcest commodity in the space is protocol level, consensus level engineers. There really isn't that many of them that are really, really good and they can really build these systems from the ground up. It's probably like 30 to 35 of them at most. Obviously, six or seven of them are in Bitcoin. Um, I believe two to three of them are in Decred and that's very, very powerful because they are like the, the precious stones of the space, essentially. It's not something that you can quickly learn. It's something which requires years of experience to, to build and, and frankly, high level of intelligence. And um, the second reason I bring this up is, yeah, so like the quality of engineers is super important because I actually think like those three or four chains that we've discussed, where the, which the convergence will cap- happen towards, they will be driven by these quality engineers. Like, let's be, let's be honest, at the end of the day, this is code, this is software. And so the quality of engineers is really, really important. Um, uh, Dave Collins in Decred. Um, uh, Marco Pierboom. Uh, Marco Pierboom. Uh, Mateo from Brazil. Uh, Jay Rick is another very talented developer. Jay Rick, right. Um, they're very, very um, capable people. And I've been extremely impressed with sort of um, their work uh, on Lightning, on Atomic Swaps, and sort of on the, on the Decred engine in general. And the second reason I bring this up is because I'm very, very bullish on Lightning Network and just layer two, layer three, all these technologies that are going to be built on top of the base chains. And um, there's only three chains that have light, Lightning right now. It's Bitcoin, Litecoin, and, and Decred. Decred, I believe, has already launched Lightning on its testnet a couple of weeks ago, um, which I was very, very happy to see. Um, and I think that's very, very cool. And just seeing how LND is a fork of BTCD, that means that the, and, and it's also written in Go, which Decred, uh, which the Decred underlying code is also written in Go, which means that the integrations are going to be relatively easy to make. Lightning is actually live on the mainnet. They're working on the, on the GUI on Decred, right. Decred on. Right, right, right. And uh, um, yeah, so um, I'm very, very bullish on Lightning. Kind uh, like just at the risk of being a little bit crude, Litecoin Lightning is a bit of a joke. Uh, but uh, I think like because Decred has Lightning and the devs that have experience with things like that. Uh, and that it's written in the exact same language uh, makes it very, very portable to Decred itself. And uh, at this point, it looks like 
Decred and Bitcoin are essentially going to be the top two lightning chains, which like that alone should tell you a lot of what you have to think about. So adding to that, so we have security, we have ledger assurance, we have quality developers. We could also add to that is adaptability and the treasury. And I would also add uh, like lightning capability and yeah, the money, the, the, the treasury. I think it's super, super important. So now why store a value first over medium of exchange? Generally, people prefer their day-to-day -day cash, i.e. their day-to-day -day medium of exchange to be as liquid as, as possible, as price stable as possible day-to-day -day, and as recognizable as possible. Now, all of these, like you, you cannot describe the current cryptocurrencies, even Bitcoin, um, by these characteristics today. Now, they have a lot of potential, but today that's not the case. And in general, in order for these things to become price stable, they need to be much, much bigger. And in order for these things to be much, much bigger, they need to receive investment inflows. And in order for them to, to um, receive investment inflows, they have to shine at things that they're already useful for. And in my opinion, that is to preserve wealth rather than spend it. But um, once these things are much bigger and much more liquid, more and more people will be using them as day-to-day -day cash. And also, frankly, I think, like as I've said, these, the next 10 years of this technology and the space as a whole isn't really going to be about payments. I think it's going to be about um, savings, wealth preservation, and just speculative investments, essentially. And um, frankly speaking, spending, if you believe that the price of Bitcoin and the price of Decred will continue climbing higher in the coming years, then spending it is irrational. Uh, what you want to do is hoard it rather than spend it. And um, essentially, the bigger the, these, these chains grow in, in size, the less irrational it becomes to spend them. But I still think they have so much upside that spending them today is uh, just illogical. Uh, the much more uh, rational thing to do, unless, unless all your money is in crypto, which for most people isn't the case, the rational thing to do is to spend inflationary fiat and then save deflationary assets like Bitcoin and Decred. So now let's cover Decred's governance and block distribution model and why it's important for the future. Um, I think sort of if we look at these things as uh, digital communities, digital governments, digital social contracts, if you consider on-chain governance as a potentially useful, potentially functional paradigm, then uh, despite what other people might tell you, I think Decred is already a clear leader in, in this approach because its chain has had on-chain governance for more than three years now and the chain has been live for, for a long time. There isn't, there isn't a chain in existence which has had functional on-chain governance um, that has existed for longer than that. I believe Dash has certain elements of on-chain governance, but I find the Decred model much more elegant and much more democratic and much more accessible because um, in order to op in order to essentially stake or operate a master node in Dash, you need um, tens of thousands of dollars at least, and this number typically skyrockets during bull markets. With Decred today, I believe the number is two two and a half thousand dollars, and um, I, in general, I think this can um, this is much more approachable by a larger number of people than Dash is, not to mention the ticking, ticket splitting capabilities to make it even more democratic. So now, how important is Decred's treasury for its future growth? To quote you, if Decred grows, it could have one day more, than, more money than 100 block streams, and it would not be tied up in any conventional corporation, almost like a neo-central bank in the sky that exists everywhere and nowhere at the same time. I, this is a little bit speculative of my part and might be a little bit controversial, but I think Decred will be the biggest DAO. And here's my thinking on this. A lot of people are talking about continuous organizations and, and DAOs. Some people, so, and, and you start thinking like, if you're going to build a DAO or you're, if, you're, if you want to make your DAO big and influential, then how are you going to build it? Some people have proposed building it on Ethereum. But I'd, like, I don't think that's maximum sovereignty because they have a history of reverting the chain. They have, uh, how should I put this? A lot of, they have certain centralized elements in, in, their, current, in their current model, in their current governance. And frankly, ETH 2.0 is probably years away and they're essentially building a brand new chain. But in any case, we, we've seen one attempt to build a DO on top of Ethereum and it didn't end very well. 
not to mention the fact that um, like Ethereum DAOs would probably rely on some kind of donations or some kind of revenue models. They, they don't have an underlying treasury. They don't have a block reward like Decred does. And, but I'll get back to that. And some people have proposed building it on top of uh, Bitcoin or on like layer two of Bitcoin or Bitcoin sidechain or something like this or, or like, um, like pegged to Bitcoin in some way. Like uh, Blockstack is doing something similar in that regard, building apps that are sort of secured by Bitcoin, etc. But that's also kind of like the UX of building that is kind of clunky and it's not sort of the most, like the best, the best way to structure it either, right? And so you're thinking and, and, like, and you start thinking about it and, and sort of two ideas cross here. I think the most sovereign and powerful and decentralized and strong way to build a DAO is for the DAO to be a whole separate blockchain. And, but it, 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 it com- combined this with the earlier thesis that I mentioned is that the biggest blockchains and the most secure blockchains are going to be the blockchains that are money. And um, there are probably going to be only like two to three of them that are big. Now, let's come back to Decred. Decred is very secure. Decred has functional governance that you need for a DAO. Um, Decred is going to be money-like because, um, because it has lightning and because it also has 21 million scarce uh, coins, just like Bitcoin. And last but not least, Decred has a huge stash of treasury, which you need for your DAO to be large, to be globally influential. And you, you kind of take a high level view and you realize that Decred is like extremely well positioned to decentralize itself even further and to mature into a full fledged decentralized autonomous organization that's not tied up to meat space whatsoever. And the main product of this organization is being money and being a very secure payment slash settlement network. And it can really do that in a way, I think it's extremely cypherpunk to be employed Essentially, it's it's cool if your employer is just a decentralized chain of blocks. It's very it's very twenty first century. Um, it's it's very sorry, it's very cyberpunk, and um, I think more and more people will start f- finding that attractive. I think in the next bull market, Decred's price will increase, and with it, the value of the money in the treasury. And I think that as Decred in general continues growing over the next two or three cycles, what we'll see is. Um, this treasury will allow us to accelerate the power of Decred and the recognition of Decred, the quality and the number of engineers working on Decred, uh, and simply just to m- make Decred known around the world. I think just we have to be honest. Money is a powerful thing. And uh, if I hope that we as a community continue to be frugal and conservative with the way we manage the treasury. So far, I'm very pleased to see a lot of bad proposals on Politea be shut down quite quickly. I hope that we don't use this frugal, uh, stoic culture when it comes to money um, in the future. But in general, um, I think sort of all these things working together Combined fork resistance, which I think is also important for a DAO to stay stable and strong. All these things uh, make me bullish on Decred, both as uh, a potential store value candidate, as well as uh, one of the biggest DAOs of the future. So what are your concerns with Decred's hybrid model in gaming the voting outcomes or how some claim it's plutocratic-like model? So to be completely frank with you, various sort of off-chain deals and voting, um, like voting, bribing, etc., probably today remains the biggest risk. I'm not too worried because I think that by the time people will consider, be it governments or competing chains or just saboteurs of various kinds, by the time they will even start thinking about buying votes on Decred, I think by that time, the market capitalization of Decred will be so much bigger than it is today that in any case, it will be very, very expensive to do. That's from a money perspective. Um, Cryptographically, it's also kind of very hard to uh, make sure that you don't just pay to someone, but they actually follow through. So it's just like not a very easy thing to set up. Um, but in general, um, it's definitely something that we have to minimize the possibility of as much as possible, both on the software as well as social layers. But um, me, as a major Decred investor, I'm going to tell you straight away that I'm not going to be selling my votes. And I'm only going to be voting in things which I think increase Decred price and Decred security. 
And I think, frankly, I think a lot of investors sort of will share my approach. Also, like, I think as time goes by, the amount, like, the ownership of Decred will get decentralized as, as many other crypto assets have cycle to cycle. Simply sourcing enough votes or buying enough votes quickly to sway some kind of vote in your favor isn't going to be something that's very, very easy to do. I think the... I think probably the biggest Decred holders and investors are, are people who've been um, with the chain or helping the chain, promoting the chain for many years. And they're probably like, a lot of them are wealthy people already. Like they're, they're not going to, like they're not going to destroy this beautiful project for like a pair of sneakers or something. Like they actually want to, like, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think like beyond seven, eight million money isn't something that releases a lot of additional pleasurable chemicals in your brain. Uh, I think at that point, probably want to change the world or, or, or build something cool uh, rather than just sort of stack as much money as possible. And I think a lot of people in the Decred community want to build sort of the system that 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 has uh, that, that is cooperative, that has functional governance and, and is socially scalable for, for, the, for like centuries to come. So Murad, what are your thoughts on the state restricting access to liberating technologies I think by the time the governments and their leaders will wake up to the quote unquote danger, at least danger to them, of blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, and some of these DAOs, they will be much bigger. They will be even more decentralized. They will be even more financially equipped. There will be even more people demanding them, holding them, working on them. And they will also be more decentralized. <laughs> Generally, once again, um, I think like people in politics, people in government aren't like the the most tech savvy people. Uh, and by the time sort of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology at large will actually start challenging governments and central banks, they will be even harder to stop than they are today. And um, also, like game theoretically speaking, governments can never agree on anything. Like even in World War II, people that were like governments that were in alliances together, like they couldn't even agree on like on one strategy or one tactic. In the UN, they're always having arguments, like people always pulling out in and out of things. In the Kyoto Protocol, like people always cheat the system. Um, Singapore or Switzerland, they're all, they're, it's in their interests to essentially diversify their assets, but also more importantly, to be a place where decentralized entrepreneurs, blockchain projects, open source devs can, can thrive. Now, even more controversially, I think... The American government like isn't so dumb. It's probably the most important government like to discuss here. I think the reason why the American government has generally been relatively permissive to blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, they know that on the off chance that these things are actually going to be huge and are going to replace like current systems, current paradigms. If that's the case, then they're I think they're thinking, let that future sort of be in America. And you're kind of seeing that right now, like the biggest infrastructure, all the service providers are in America. Like the best crypto lawyers are here. The best crypto exchanges are here. Some of them, um, the best crypto custodians are here. Uh, the best crypto entrepreneurs are in New York and San Francisco. Biggest crypto hedge funds are here, etc. All right. And, um, I believe like if you look at full nodes and coin ownership, they're the biggest in America also. And, uh, America and Western Europe, I mean, like uh, where there is freedom, there is crypto. It's kind of ironic that originally Bitcoin was to support, supposed to liberate the third world, but really it's more of like, a, in many ways, ironically, like a luxury product for rich first world people. Now, of course, that will change with time, but um, high net worth individuals and institutions will be sort of key drivers in the next couple of couple of decades. Yeah. What are some of your long term concerns uh, with Decred in the future? I think it's the network effects of Bitcoin that are the biggest risk. Um, could it be that Bitcoin simply takes all the monetary premium and essentially, quote unquote, sucks all the air out of the room? It's certainly possible. Um, I still think Decred will has strong chances to outperform Bitcoin um, in the next cycle or two. And I'm personally making a bet on that front with a sizable chunk of my personal portfolio. But I'll be completely frank with you. And honestly, as a fund manager, it might even be against my own interests to say something like this. Because that, that, that will simply mean that I'll have to trade more and invest less and the former is more stressful. Absolutely. Right. But um, essentially, I think other than Bitcoin, Decred, and skilled trading, if you can do it, 
<laughs> everything else in this space is just useless trash. Um, now, of course, there will be a couple of other non-monetary things that will be built. I do think some some DeFi Web three Web three point oh DAP things are going to eventually come to fruition, but I think that we're probably like five to seven years early in that regard. We need to build a solid monetary foundation. We need to build actually solid, hyper secure, hyper decentralized blockchains before all of those things come about. And for the next cycle or two, for me, as I've said many times, it's predominantly about money, money itself. Most definitely. What um what are you most optimistic about when it comes to Decred's future? It's Decred is like a hedge from a from a variety of perspectives. It's it's a political hedge in terms of its governance. It's a it's a um, it's a hedge in terms of its actual blockchain structure. It's a financial hedge because it has treasury, and it's a fork hedge because it has fork resistance. So it's like a also um, like it's like harder to attack from the inside and from the outside, and uh, it has like a completely different uh, hash algorithm on the proof of work side also. It's a very, very powerful shield, essentially. It's, it's, what I really like is that it's, you can think of Decred as like a lizard, but with very like strong armor. So Decred is secure, but at the same time, it's also more adaptable because um, Decred's governance uh, and the various facets of it, Decred's Politea system, uh, Decred's treasury management, Decred's on-chain voting, it generally allows the system to evolve faster. So what took... Bitcoin, uh, three years to, um, to, to, to create SegWit and eventually to come to Lightning, something like that um, can take months instead of years in Decred. And uh, in general, this technology, whether we like it or not, it will need to evolve, we will need to add features, we will need to add code, and um, community being just more nimble, more flexible, more adaptable, a lot of people might not be appreciating these things right now, but there will come a time where these things, in my opinion, will prove to be very, very useful. So give me the emotional state of your relation with Decred in one word. Bullish. I'll take it. So now this is a question that I ask everyone. Um, what advice would you give Satoshi? Keep remaining unknown. That one's popular. Extremely. So now I'm going to get into the Decred Bulletproof section. This is the part of the show where I've gathered statements and questions from around the web. Some of these are your friends. Uh, and I'm going to play devil's advocate against Decred. So let's hear what Murad has to say. If Decred was to fail, what would be the cause of its death? The, danger, the biggest danger to this technology, especially to non-Bitcoin crypto assets, is apathy. Um, I think that kind of a decreds weakness, but I also think this is an opportunity at the same time, uh, is that the thesis and the value proposition of decred is, as we can see, um, difficult to explain in like one or two sentences alone. Um, and because of this, um, a lot of people don't understand why some of the decreds features and some of decreds sort of differentiations, why they're valuable. At the same time, as I've said, uh, this is an opportunity because I think that in the next seven or eight years, there will be much many more analysts, researchers on the institutional side and on the private side studying these things. They'll realize that, oh, the Decred is actually actually super secure. Oh, Decred is actually like it can evolve faster. They're adding new things like every two, three months. Oh, Decred is like the Lightning is actually like built by like the Lightning Foundation was like taken from like Decred code, etc. Like people will learn these things. And essentially... We are trying to front run the market discovering some of these amazing features for themselves. And I believe that as, as I've said, as the IQ of the market grows, Decred will be repriced to enter at least the top five of the space. So now let's get to the second one. Some say it's good for it to be difficult to change consensus. Decred does nothing special other than draw focus to a specific activation method baked into the protocol layer, which can be ported into any other project. What are your thoughts? So consensus engine is definitely the most important element of blockchains. Decred is, I think, striking a really good balance between difficult to change enough, but still uh, more adaptable than Bitcoin. And like, if you look at the required rules, I believe you, to make any kind of on-chain change to consensus algorithm in Decred, you still need 90% of the miners, or, or was it 95% of the miners, to uh, approve uh, or to, to uh, upgrade before the change is even made to the new software. Yeah. Um, 
that has the the relevant change already in the code. And you also need 75% of the stakers, of the investors to approve that also. And to me, this is a relatively high bar. It's a much higher bar than Politea and, and, and treasury management stuff. It's the highest bar uh, in, of, of sort of the things, of the changes that um, you can make in Decred. And uh, frankly, to me, this is um, still hard to change enough while being more nimble and more flexible. And so to me, it's completely fine. I think like we, we've seen uh, the Decred community successfully changed the ticketing algorithm, although, although that was against the interests of miners, but the, the, the investors won anyway, which I was really pleased about. We've seen the activate the... Um, the, like the 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 needed opcodes and the needed foundations to activate lightning, and that was done relatively smoothly. I believe that received ninety nine point seven percent of the votes, uh, so that was amazing. Um, and in general, I think that I have faith in the collective wisdom and the collective decision making of the decred stakeholders. I think that there are people who've thought about blockchain governance uh, in a very long term, uh, low time preference way. And in general, if you look at it. Like the opinions of stakers might be different person to person, but I think like the average of it or the median of it, when you kind of pull them all, all together, what do we want? We want decred price to go up and we want the chain to remain secure. We, of course, we might have different ways of what that means and how to achieve that. But in general, people will only vote for things which the average stakeholder will think will increase the price. And in general, I think that aligns incentives very, very well. The fact that um, in order to even have a voice in Decred, your coins have to be illiquid sometime between uh, a week and five months makes you really, really care because your savings, your wealth, which are one of the most important things in the world, are, are tied up to the chain. And so um, I think people will still generally be conservative, both with the money and the on-chain changes, but things like Lightning Network and Atomic Swaps, the fact that we can implement them relatively quickly compared to other blockchains is a beautiful thing. As fast as they can be coded, most definitely. Um, let's get to the third one here. Bitcoin launched without a pre-mine. All other projects outside of Bitcoin are built around the financial interests of their creators. What are your thoughts on that? So Decred did have a 4% pre-mine. I believe the other 4% was airdropped which is completely fine. And it was actually required to bootstrap the proof of stake element. Um, and to make sure no one destroyed the chain while it was early. Right. Uh, I think the 4% pre-mine is, like, is, is uh, small enough like not to really matter. Like, I personally don't really care about it. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's fine that uh, like, uh, Dave Collins and a couple of other early uh, like Decred people who essentially have been like, slaving away building this, these consensus algorithms for three years straight and even before that on BTCD, the fact that they own um, a, cu- a couple of percent of the network, I think that's good. Because like we want these like geniuses essentially having a financial interest in here. I would rather them own two to three percent of the network than than zero, because that means that they'll actually keep working on it, which is something that as a decoder investor, like I want them to stay and I want them to keep adding these beautiful features. Uh, also, like Satoshi, according to according to various calculations, Satoshi has a million coins, which is like four percent, like a four point two percent as well, right? So uh, it essentially kind of like the same thing. And like Satoshi is probably like one one person or like two to three people, right? That's like the the two main theories. While the original Decred team was uh, like a bit a bit more people than that. So and that four percent was distributed among several several people. Correct. So the three founders and and the C zero dev, dev team. Right. Um, like those four percent were distributed distributed enough. And um, and to mention, BTC Suite was paid for out of out of C zero's pocket. Right. So there was no there was no compensation for them building that. Right. You know, right. That was an expense. For- and like also like we're we're talking about like um like I, I ran the numbers the other day. We're talking about like four hundred or six hundred thousand dollars like at the time. So really it's not that much. Correct. Right? It was the- priced at fifty cents. Right, 49 right, cents. Right. So it really wasn't like we're not talking about like millions, billions of dollars. Like you, you look at Definity or Hashgraph, all these projects that haven't a Polkadot, all these projects that haven't even launched yet pricing themselves at like six, seven billion, taking a billion in investments or whatever. Like Decred is like, it's as I've observed Decred through the years and their expenditure styles, uh, their, their, their expenditure to software output ratio is the best I've seen in this space. Like they work, they, they don't spend that much and the quality of the code is really, really good. So now we'll get to the last one here. People will invest in things that make the world better. 
whether it be time or money, they will invest. You don't need a dev fund embedded into your protocol to incentivize development. You recognize that? Yes. <laughs> Give me your thoughts. I think, uh, was it something that I said a couple years ago? Something Marty Ben said. Marty Ben said, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, uh, For sure. When Jack released, uh, uh, what is it, Square Crypto? For and sure. He, and he announced that he was going to invest in Bitcoin. I mean, so, but why don't we do both? Like we can do both, which is even more powerful. We can make the world a better place and we can make money doing that. And I think that's completely beautiful. That's completely fine. At the end of the day, like high quality engineers aren't cheap. That's one. Two, um, like people still need to like pay for their children's school and stuff. Like you still need to make, get money out of somewhere. Like, uh, bit, a lot of Bitcoin core devs are either paid by like early blockstream funding or they are paid out of like Alex Morcus's pocket at chain code. Like it's, that money still has to come from somewhere. So, um, I kind of think of Decred as kind of like Norway or Sweden, these advanced societies, which have like uh, slightly higher taxes, but their society is like very, very strong and beautiful. Right. So the immaculate conception of Bitcoin is not going to be matched again, you know? So, so Murad, give me your closing thoughts. I really appreciate you coming and hanging out here in New York. Um, give me your closing thoughts and, and any message you may have to newcomers or potential stakeholders. Yeah, um, there's like six or seven introductory pieces on Decred that are really, really good. Um, I would strongly recommend uh, JYP's talk at um, MIT. There's a good lecture. He did a video uh, called Sovereignty in Blockchains. Very, very cool. Uh, Zubair Zia's articles uh, on the sort of the defense mechanisms and the, the, how Decred's governance differentiates against Bitcoins is, are amazing. Uh, Permeable Nino series on uh, ledger assurances in crypto and a couple of his other um, coming uh, up articles that aren't released yet uh, on the how uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general are an accounting revolution in many ways. Uh, I really strongly recommend you to read both of those, um, the latter one in particular when it comes out. Uh, there's a lot of all of Richard's red, uh, all of Richard Red's articles on Medium are absolutely amazing. Yeah, Richard's brilliant. Yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> like definitely start there. Uh, just hit me up if you have any questions. But like essentially, I think like Decred is the second best coin. <laughs> Where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Mustop Murad, and you can also email me at Murad at AdaptiveCapital.co. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you for having me.